My name is Will Kimlicka. I'm a political philosopher at Queen's University, and my specialty is on issues of multiculturalism, or uh, how people of different languages, cultures, and religions can live together in a single political community. One of the big challenges uh, for all societies is issues of diversity. Um, people, as a result of a variety of globalization processes, people are encountering others of different, of different religions, languages, cultures on a, on a more regular basis. We need to, to learn to, to be able to cooperate across ethnic and, and religious lines um, and to be able to govern together democratically. Uh, so um, I think this is uh, one of the most important challenges for for societies to today, and we can see, um, I mean, at its worst, the failure to deal with these issues can be catastrophic. I, I think what we're seeing in, in Iraq and Syria is, is the kind of worst case scenario of societies just completely falling apart into violence, um, uh, uh, split along, along ethnic and, and religious lines. But even, even short of violence, even when we don't see violence, I, th I think this is an important issue. So if, if you look at what's happening in, in Europe today around issues of immigration, I mean, there's not, it's not civil war, it's not, it's not the breakdown of society, but there's this uh, really quite overwhelming uh, anxiety about migration, about refugees, um, and it's, it's I would say it's kind of poisoning the political environment. It's it's very hard to it's hard to deal with other issues of social progress if people are um, obsessing about and frightened of of the people they're living with. So so I do think that that um, that the organizers of this panel um, have rightly um, decided to make issues of of. Uh, cultural difference, one of the central themes. One of the things that I hope we can do in, in the report is to suggest ways of discussing uh, cultural, and ethnic, and religious differences that um, avoid the dangers of... Um, there's really there's two, there's two kinds of dangers that we need to avoid. One is um, polarizing, uh, so treating people who are different from us as entirely completely different from us and ignoring all the important ways in which we're all human, that we have, we have many things in common. So we need to vo avoid um, overly dramatic and essentialized representations of the other uh, as someone completely different from us. On the other hand, um, contrary to many earlier recommend uh, uh, theories it's not the case that modernization or globalization is flattening cultural difference o on the contrary there are many ways in which in which globalization actually um, stimulates people to to uh, assert and defend their identities and also provides them with tools to be able to mobilize around uh, identities and differences and so um, we don't want to exaggerate um, how different we are from our, our co-citizens or co-residents, but on the other hand, we, we can't ignore those differences. So we need, we need to find a way of putting, acknowledging difference but keeping them in perspective and, and, not, um, and thinking about what are, the, what are the institutions, what are the public policies that allow us to, to interact constructively across these differences. So what kind of education systems, what kind of media, but also what kinds of political representation um, allow us to express and represent these diff differences. There's actually the, um, the, the question of how to acknowledge um, and, and represent diversity actually pops up in a, in a surprisingly wide range of institutional contexts. I have been working for many years on the idea of liberal multiculturalism. So that's, that's a term um, that's meant to highlight 
the, the fact that um, these issues of, of difference and diversity um, are emerging within a broader liberal democratic context. And so, and I think, um, so part of my goal in much of my work has been to, to focus on how issues of, of difference and diversity take a different form in contemporary liberal democratic societies than they have in other, in other periods in history or in other uh, political contexts. So, so we have, I, I, in, at least in, in the Western democracies, but increasingly elsewhere as well, um, we have uh, democratic constitutions that set the that set the rules for for a shared life, and um, I've tried to highlight the ways in which, um, rather than viewing, there's, there's, there's too often I think a, a fear amongst many people that uh, diversity threatens liberal democracies and that, that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something we need to continually um, minimize or contain, there's this kind of omnipresent language about having to contain diversity to make it safe for liberal democracy. And, and my own view is in a way almost the reverse. It's that if you, if you have the, the good fortune to live in a consolidated liberal democracy, that actually um, allows for a much wider range of peaceful, democratic ways for people to express their differences. So that, so that again, if, if you have the, the, the good fortune of, of living in a liberal under a liberal democratic constitution that's, that's with effective rule of law, um, it is, uh, I, I think we should recognize people as having um, the right to express their, their distinct identities, but also to recognize that um, uh, there are lots of avenues, lots of, of uh, uh, routes for people to engage in, in peaceful, cooperative, democratic expressions of difference, which, which shouldn't be seen as a threat, shouldn't be seen as a pathology, um, but it should be seen as a, a normal and natural part of, of democratic life. So part of, I guess part of the, the message that I've tried to promote in, in some of my work is to, is to just kind of normalize diversity. It's not, a, it's not unnatural, it's not a threat, it's a normal and natural part of life in a democracy that people have diverse identities and that they want to express them in private and in public. And, and, and we have some good examples um, around the world of how to enable that without, without it causing undue polarization or instability or conflict. My, my sense of what, what the most important issue is um, changes, um, I, I wouldn't say day to day, but it, but it so I, the, the, I mean, what's happening in Europe with, with migration, um, it's, it's been a striking, I've been, I've been working in this field now, I mean, f for, for 25 years, so I've seen a lot of ups and downs in terms of what issues are, are most politically salient, what, what issues drive political agendas. Um, but the rise of, of anti-xenophobic populist, anti-immigrant forces in Europe is, is really striking um, in, in the last five to 10 years. It wasn't actually predicted by many of the people who were writing on these issues in the 1980s and 1990s. So things have gone worse than, than we had expected. Um, and it raises a lot of, of uh, difficult questions about what is it about the nature of this moment in history that um, so many people are so fearful about this, this particular wave of, of migration in Europe. Um, I think that's a complicated question. It's, it's partly uh, related to the, the post 9-11 fears about security and terrorism. 
uh, it's it's partly related to people's anxieties about the the European Union and and whether the whether Europe is failing as a political project. It's partly related to the to the economic crises and. So, I mean, it's probably a, a constellation of factors that have come together to make that issue toxic. It's, that, that issue has become toxic politically in the last five to 10 years um, in, a, in, a, in a disturbing way. And I think social scientists are still catching up to that political development. Um, but, but on the other hand, I, I, uh, I'm from Canada. And so I think that at least in Canada, our, our biggest challenge in relation to diversity is our relations with the indigenous peoples of, of Canada, the Indians and the Inuit, which is, a, you know, that, that's a long, long standing uh, problem that we've never dealt with satisfactorily as a society. And I think that's true about most of the, most of the settler states, the Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand, many countries in Latin America have never, have never truly faced, never truly confronted uh, the, the need to address the, the history of colonialism in their own countries. And so I, I sometimes worry that the, the um, in, in my work, I try, to, I, I try to keep my hand in all of these issues. But I, I think that, to some extent, the current crises around migration has been displacing attention to this much older but still very serious problem about how how, uh, how we relate to indigenous peoples. I, I would like to, to think that the IPSP can, can contribute to uh, the way public policies are debated. I think there's been some really excellent social science done on a lot of these issues, in, including in, in my field of, of multiculturalism and uh, interethnic relations, but um, Trying to get that social science um, into the into broader public debates and even more specifically into policy making is often quite frustrating. And I don't think it's something that individual academics can do on their own. I I I, I think it's it's important that we try to pool our resources and try to come up with documents like this that that um, where possible show that there is a clear emerging consensus on certain issues within, within the academic community, but also try to explain those findings in a way that makes sense to, to policymakers. Um, and uh, this is something that I've, I've, I've been interested in virtually for my entire career is how to, uh, how to bring academic um, research into the into the policy making process. And I, I think it actually varies enormously from country to country and from topic to topic. The extent to which policymakers are able to to take advantage of of what we of our research. Um, but I, I I do have hopes that something like the IPSP can really uh, can really make a difference. <laughs>